Welcome to The Loins of History, a podcast connecting history to current events in an effort to improve political and historical literacy. My name is Jay, and I'm joined by my co-host, Colin. And this week is part two in our series on the collapse of the Bronze Age, which is part of a larger season on the fall of civilizations or the fall of empires, whichever you like. So we've been discussing over the last several episodes, like different empires, different civilizations. We really want to think about why these different civilizations collapsed in an effort to kind of understand our context today, uh, especially here in the West. It kind of feels like the United States and the, and the West writ large are on a, on a relative t- decline. So we want to understand that. And this week, Colin is going to walk us through uh, the second part of the collapse of the Bronze Age. Uh, so with that, Colin. What you got for us? Jay, thanks. This is, this is going to be a pretty good thought exercise, I think, as far as history. And what I mean by that, when I was preparing for the episode, um, I like to consider myself pretty well versed, at least you know, at, a, at an amateur level of, of all things history. And you can kind of reference a specific time in history and be like, yeah, I, I kind of know a little bit about that. Prior to really digging into this episode, I didn't know a ton about the Bronze Age. Like I had, you know, we had all heard about ancient Egypt and done a little bit of studying, like heard about the Hittites and, you know, the Minoans, but we really didn't have a much of a a deeper understanding than that. So this has been pretty exciting and very, I've learned a lot just from researching for this episode. And then when it comes to the Bronze Age collapse, just how catastrophic it was of an event. And, And here's what Eric Klein from 1177 BC, the year civilization collapsed, kind of summarized this event. He said, the magnitude of the catastrophe was enormous. It was a loss such as the world would not see again until the Roman Empire collapsed more than 1,500 years later. And it's really interesting if you put that in the context of it because the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Mycenaeans, prior to them, the Minoans were also, had also disappeared. But even other empires like the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Elamites, it were and the Egyptians were significantly diminished. So even though they may not have gone away, their power and influence uh, and their golden age, so to speak, disappeared. All of because this relatively short period of time called the Bronze Age collapse. And I just thought that was really, really fascinating. And as I started digging through this, through some of Robert Drew, Eric Klein, some of their writings, you really start to go down kind of a rabbit hole of like, well, what if this? And because a lot of it is, we have archaeological evidence, we have historical evidence that we can cross-reference, but even still, it, it's kind of an incomplete picture. Um, so, it's really fun just to sit there and think like, well, okay, maybe the Sea Peoples came down because of this, and it was this drought here that caused their migration. And um, I think that's a little bit of what it is. So, what I'm going to try and do is give, an, give another sort of specific survey of what some of the um, theories are on the collapse. Um, what, and I'm going to draw from Robert Drew especially, and what he believes really ended the Bronze Age and why. Um, and then throw in some additional um, information really around like the historicity of Greek myth, specifically around like the Iliad and the Odyssey in this time period and kind of connecting those two things. And then um, I also just as a Another rabbit hole that I went on here going through um, the Hebrew Exodus because that occurred right around this time. And I kind of put together my own little, my own little fun theory around where they, what was going on around this time because it fits yeah. in if you are in uh, a, late, a late stage Exodus theory. And I didn't even know there were multiple theories on the, say, the date of the Exodus. I don't Exodus. know if I am or not, Colin. <laughs> apparently, it's a, hotly <laughs> contest, it's a hotly contested issue amongst biblical scholars apparently that I found out. Just by doing some some simple searches. So, um, just to start off, um, let me. I'm going to go from the uh, the end of bronze the Bronze Age uh, changes in warfare and the catastrophe from from uh, Robert Drews. And really early on in the book, he gives a um, it um, it goes through kind of the Near East. So I think Greece, modern Turkey, uh, Palestine, Israel, Syria, that area. 
and Egypt. So that's the the Eastern Mediterranean. That's where we're really, really focusing on. And what he does is he, he puts a map and he shows these major cities that were Bronze Age cities that were all sacked or significantly destroyed and damaged within this. And there's about 50 of them. And just to name a few of them, like within Greece, there was, um, and I'm going through the ones that you might have heard of, Mycenae, Thebes, Ioikos. Uh, within Crete, there was Knossos, Anatolia, so that think Turkey, there was Troy, uh, Miletus, Mersin, Tarsus, Hattusus, which is the capital of the Hittites. Um, within Cyprus, there was Sinda, Eknomi, uh, Syria, Ugarit, Kadesh, where there's a huge battle a few, few decades before the collapse uh, between the Hittites and the Egyptians. Uh, Hamath, Aleppo, uh, seems Aleppo's had quite a few um, historically shattering events occur and happen to it. And then in the southern Levant, uh, there was Bethel, Hazor, um, Megiddo, uh, L- Lakshish, and Ashad. Um, so like all of the, and there's, there's several more, I just listed out a few of them, but all of and these- those are all with, the places that this historian believes the sea peoples like raided and sacked these, all these cities? Well, either they were the ones that, I'm not going to right now tie it to the sea peoples, they were destroyed dam- or severely damaged or depopulated all within a, a few decades. So, Robert Drews really points to 1200 BC as this, this time period. And I think in the last episode, I said like you could really estimate like 1300 to 1100, you know, plus or minus 50 years on, on the 1200, and you're probably pretty accurate. There's a lot of historical evidence to put it like right in, in that 1200 BC. And I'll get into that here in a second. But most of it, uh, there's substantial archaeological evidence. So, like I said, damaged or destroyed, these cities, and that was the ones I named were just a sampling of like the 50 or so that he listed. There's some historians that also include a lot of the smaller villages around there. Um, so those are the cities that were affected. And within that Near East kind of collapse, there's a few different theories on why um, they were damaged, depopulated, or destroyed. Um, so there was obviously an earthquake theory, and that was put forward by um, CFA Schaefer. And what he had found were were six of those cities that had what he believed were severe um, damage done by an earthquake. So there's some historical record that had pointed to um, earthquakes occurring at that time. And based on his findings, he believed that they these six cities were destroyed by earthquakes. And then that those cataclysmic earthquakes that all occurred within a few years of each other, not only destroyed these cities, destroyed the populations around there and forced a migration. Now, um, I think some of the criticism that has come on there um, has been, well, why would an earthquake cause a subsequent fire? Why would an earthquake, um, you know, why would they, an earthquake cause people to loot all of these areas? Because we don't find any loot in them. And really the, the overwhelming criticism was like, yeah, it could have been an earthquake, but it most likely wasn't. And if it was an earthquake, um, that would not that would have caused damage because as as Robert Drew later said, he goes, we have a lot of evidence and historical writings to back up the idea or the the theory that earthquakes occurred and maybe they destabilized areas, but they didn't necessarily destroy cities; they damaged buildings, and then we they simply rebuilt those damaged yeah. buildings, those damaged cities. So it's not likely yeah. that an earthquake caused a collapse of yeah. multiple I mean, civilizations in a region. We see this in Japan all the time now. Like they, they regularly have pretty, pretty good earthquakes, and yet we don't see this. Like, oh, you know, aside from the Fukushima nuclear, nuclear reactor, but that was that was a, you know, a second, third order effect from the earthquake. But like, we don't see. Now, granted, you know, there's obviously a huge technology difference and buildings and blah 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 blah. But even then, it's like it's not like an earthquake wipes these cities off the face of the map. There's validity in the fact that there were, a, if you were to take the idea then and say, hey, he's got some compelling evidence to say that earthquakes, there was a lot of earthquakes and they seem to strike cities. I, I'm going to, I might even say that it could have happened at Troy and we'll get into that in a second. It's just the fact that was that the cause, the root cause? It's unlikely. 
you know, and then there's the theories that are forth about drought. So we and I talked about it last episode. There was there is a lot of significant evidence to point to droughts occurring. Now, Drew kind of breaks into this a little bit more and says that yes, there were a lot of droughts. However, we have Hittite writings, we have writings from Pharaoh Menepta, basically saying, yeah, food might be tight, but it's not at a civilizational level. So and even in areas like Mycenae, a, a drought is not going to cause a rapid population decline like overnight, right? So as we see in like Mycenae, in Canaan, and so think south of the Levant, like I was saying, Israel, modern day Israel, they suffered around, the, the, around 1200 BC, like a massive population decline almost within a year or two. That Droughts are severe, but they don't cause that. What droughts do cause is migrations of peoples, i.e. the sea peoples, which we can get to in a second. So, if anything, what it would have done a drought rather than cause a civilizational collapse, it would have fueled a systems collapse. And I'll get into that in a second. Well, actually, I'll start. I'll go, I'll go for systems collapse because that kind of leads, it's a good segue. So, like within systems collapse, part of the, part of what makes the Bronze Age the Bronze Age is where you had a relatively peaceful time and you had a massive amount of trade occurring between these separate civilizations. So you would have timber from Lebanon appearing in Mycenae, Greece, in Assyria, in Babylon. You would have tin from all over. And actually, tin is fairly rare. And so tin is obviously a key component in bronze. So the fact that bronze was able to be proliferated at this point is in and of itself in an effect of this systems that existed within the Bronze Age. So part of the the problem and the reason civilizations do collapse is if you have an economy and a population that is dependent on goods that you can't produce, you rely on something external, if that pipeline is suddenly severed like it was in, in, uh, in the Bronze Age collapse, you can't support the population anymore, right? So you can't get grains from Egypt in, say, Greece if there is a drought, and that's going to force people to move. So, like this idea of systems collapse. Now, here's kind of my thought process on the systems collapse theory. In order for a systems to a system to collapse, it has to have internal and external strife, and I think that's what these these earthquakes, the droughts, and then iron working would have put on it. So, iron tools, um, iron tools were started to be proliferated right around this time. And iron tools functionally were obviously of higher, well, not necessarily higher quality than bronze, but they were more easily mass produced. And if you think about the way a society was structured in the Bronze Age, you it was very hierarchical. There was massive amounts of slaves and dependency on slave labor. And it's kind of interesting. There's some theories about iron working and iron and the proliferation of not just iron weapons, but iron tools kind of destabilizing that because now suddenly peasants in the farmland could produce more with less. Like I said, bronze is expensive because you have to rely on tin, which is rare. Suddenly now iron, which is extremely common, is widely available and now we yeah. can smelt it and put and alloy this for all of these peasants. Suddenly now that they can build more, they can have higher yields on their farm, suddenly now they have weapons that they can mass produce. And so armies can now go from small, poorly armed gaggles, essentially, run by, you know, with chariots out in front of them to mass produce mm-hmm. professional armies, which is what the Assyrians did. Um, interesting. So it's, it's an interesting thought that the proliferation of iron suddenly destabilized a social system within the Bronze Age. Yeah. And that destabilization of a social, of a social hierarchy and, and system combined with the external pressures of earthquakes, droughts, suddenly lent itself to say, okay, now this trade this, that we have now is suddenly no more or it's lessening. And then I think the final nail in the coffin of the, um, of the, the systems collapse would be the migrations of people mm-hmm. where you now suddenly have a large group of people who are moving through uh, your civilization, your territory, your kingdom, and they are not only a military threat, but they're an economic threat mm-hmm. too as well. And suddenly, if they're standing between you and another another kingdom that you rely on for trade, like you can't get those goods anymore. 
Yeah. So real quick, before we go on the migration thing, something that popped in my head as you were talking is just like, wow, there are disruptive technologies and there are disruptive resources, right? Like, and that this like happens over and over and over again throughout history. I, you know, I'm probably like a lot of people listening right now. I don't know a whole lot about the Bronze Age. Uh, I mean, I've read the Old Testament. That's about <laughs> that's the extent of my Bronze Age knowledge. I'll get uh, into that. Um, right. Um, but the like, even as you're talking, it's like, man, the it's like everyone was relying on tin. It was a valuable resource, you know. But then that made became really expensive, and this cheaper, good iron, like that you could find relatively a lot more places like it was actually produced better blah 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 it's like how many examples throughout history can we think like right now oil obviously is huge uh you going back to our fall of the antebellum south thing like the cotton gin was a a disruptive technology because it made slave labor extremely lucrative and that brought you know social social disruption you know blah 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 and it's all these things that are like you know, we would say they're good, right? You know, even more recently, I think the computer, the internet, uh, you know, like the information proliferation type stuff, like these are all good things, right? But then we have, oh, who's going to make the semiconductors? Uh, you know, the information themselves, like changes society. And like, there's just all these little things that like, it happened in the Bronze Age for what seems rudimentary, but yet it can have drastic altering things. And I think uh, my final point for, uh, for Turner Becker, you call it, <laughs> is, you know, as a millennial that grew up in the 90s, I think one thing that's really difficult for millennials to kind of understand, and I, and I speak as one of them, is we kind of grew up in this era of relative like peace and security, at least here in the United States, right? Um, we like things were gravy. We we didn't have a whole lot of conflict in the world. Uh, I mean, Republicans and Democrats still hated one another, and there was issues in the Balkans and whatnot. But like, we were more or less on the up and up. And it's important for us to remember, like these massive social disruptions. I think September 11th was the first one. That was kind of a big wake up call. COVID obviously was another big one, a big wake up call. Uh, you know, there's nothing to say, like we could be a year away, six months away, five years away, 10 years away. You never know, but these, it's worth thinking through these disruptive technologies, these disruptive resources and thinking through like, okay, how do we adapt? If we don't adapt, bad things happen. Uh, that kind of thing. Well, it's interesting. It's kind of like, uh, there was a, a big crit. You're talking about when we were growing up globalization was super like a, it was a super hot topic because, and it was seen as a net positive right because it was like we can do yeah, it was a good, we can, it was a good thing i'm doing right, air we quotes. can good outsource thing. this you know we can do we can have you're talking about who's going to make the chips well all of the semiconductors and chips are made in taiwan but then they're going to be you know we're going to harvest or we're going to pull these rare earth metals from you know country x and then we're going to move them here and then we're going to move them here and then they're going to taiwan and then they're going to go to a distributor and the, the headquarters in the us right so you have these extremely complicated systems. And then during COVID, we're like, oh, wow. Um, one disease, you know, one plague, if, if that's what we want to call it, one plague, and suddenly now everything shuts down and we can't get all this stuff. Like, right. what's going to happen when something more severe happens? Or think about when, I think it was post COVID, but like when that one shipping, that container ship got stuck in the Suez for like two days. Mm, oh yeah, and yeah. Like that one event where you had one ship blocking the Suez, and like I was looking at basically like satellite images of all the shipping lanes, mm. and they came to a standstill. Yeah. And so then it created like this burble effect where you had like one stuck ship here, and it was like, okay, now your stuff is not going to get here for six months because we have to make it and build it, but we can't get the raw materials get for another yeah. three months. 
And then yeah. we're on back order for all these other things that are piling up. Yeah, so there were tons of second, third order effects to that. It's an interesting way to connect the two, right? And it's, it's I think it shows kind of a little bit of, of humanity's arrogance to say like, it'll never happen again. Yeah, we're above no. that. Like, no, absolutely not. It could literally happen tomorrow. <laughs> if you were to <laughs> well, ask- it's happening if you were, right now. <laughs> it, it, it could be, it could, yeah, it could be. Ha- I mean, there's, we had the benefit of the past 35 years or so of living in a, basically a single- uh, what is it? It's a non multipolar world where it's basically yeah, like yeah. the US called the uni, shots. Unipolar. Unipolar. That, thank you. Yeah. Now we're moving to a multipolar. And what happens when those two poles hate each other, right? Like, yeah. well, what's going to happen? And it's yeah. now we're back to the Cold War. Quoting, all, all that to say is. Mearsheimer there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> multipolar all, all worlds say, are the most dangerous. Yeah. Well, all that to say is like. If you were to ask the a- average Mycenaean in 1300, like, hey, everything you've built is going to be gone. You're not going to, mm. your people aren't going to build anything for like 400 years and we're not going to write anything down. He'd be like, no, no, we're not. Or the Hittites yeah. in Hattusa, be like, no way. So, kind of back to the systems collapse piece, like, this is, this is a quote from, from Mario Liverani. In general, I belong to the group of scholars who consider both on a theoretical level and in the case of the late Bronze Age crisis, internal factors of socioeconomic economic dynamics to be preeminent and the external migratory factor, mi- migratory in, in quotes, factors to be rather limited from a quantitative point of view. They represent the result more than the cause of the crisis coming as a part of a response with a sort of multiplier effect. Um, I... Th- you know, what the, the internal factors he's referring to is like plague, famine, drought, earthquakes, all of those, uh, you know, and then the social factors, like I was saying, kind of the social order being upended. The way I see it is kind of similar to him is like these earthquakes, the droughts, the iron working and the societal issues kind of upending this along with migrations of people kind of all culminated together to form this collapse. Like you can't point to one of these, uh, and say, this is why. Well, there's a big earthquake, so all these civilizations fell. It was a combination of all of them working together. However, I do think one of these was really true, the true multiplier of it, I, this, and that's the migration in the Sea Peoples. I think they were the, the kind of tipping point, if you will, of what ended up happening to the rest of Bronze Age civilizations. And we'll go through the Sea Peoples and kind of do our best to figure out who they were and what they did. So, who exactly were the Sea Peoples? Well, it's hard to determine exactly who they were. What we do have is a few written records that reference these Sea Peoples throughout the east, the Eastern Mediterranean. So, looking at a, cu- a few key sources, specifically on Fer- a temple inscription in Pharaoh Ramesses the Third of Pharaoh Ramesses the Third, this is what it says when it was translated. As for, their, as for the foreign countries, they made a conspiracy in their isles. Removed and scattered in the fray were the lands at one time. No land could stand before their arms, from Hatti, Kodi, Carchemish, Ureth, and Yerezon, but they were cut off at one time. A camp was set up in the place in Amor. They desolated its people, and its land was like that which had never come into being. They were coming while the flame was prepared before them, forward to Egypt, their confederation was the Peleset, Shekel, Shekelesh, Denyan, and Weshesh, lands united. They laid their hands upon the lands at the very circuit of the earth, their heart confident and trusting, our plan will succeed. A lot to digest in that. So there's also a reference made to them from Hammurapi or Hammurapi from Ugrit a few years prior to this, where he writes a desperate letter to the king of to Cyprus and basically begs for aid and warning that the sea peoples were coming. Unfortunately for him, a few months later, Ugrit was wiped out. Now, if we take a look at what Ramses III said, it's kind of interesting. First off, he actually names these sea peoples, but looking at their names, it's kind of hard to infer exactly who they were. Looking at Peleset, Shekel, Shekeles, Denyan, and Weshesh, we have an idea of where they might be from, but it's not like they were keeping written records. And that's what makes this so difficult to ascertain. So, one of the theories on the Peleset actually is that they're the predecessors to the Philistines. So, if you've ever studied biblical history, the Peleset um, or the Philistines, excuse me, would have been mortal enemies of the Israelites. 
And the theory behind this is A, linguists have looked at the similarities between the words. And then ultimately, after Ramesses III defeated the Sea Peoples in the late 1100s BC, they were resettled in the lands of Canaan. So there's kind of an idea of, well, did they come from, uh, you know, were they initially Philistines and this was just the Egyptian translation? Were they from that area and then they were returned there? Or were they from somewhere else, probably north and Thrace, more north of Greece, potentially from Greece? Where in the Mediterranean were they from? And ultimately, they, they were settled, we believe, in Canaan and became known as the Philistines. The Denyan linguists kind of kind of have a theory that they might be the Dene, or another word that Homer uses for the Greeks. So they could have been some tor- sort of Greek Aegean tribe or confederation that sailed south. The Shekelesh um, and Shekel, I was doing some interesting reading. They believe that, as you, because you can see in this inscription earlier, there's reference to isles. There's some theories that they came from Italy, Sardinia, Sicily, those areas in the Western Mediterranean, and they would have been some sort of ans- or predecessor or kind of similar tribe to the Etruscans. But another thought was, well, they may have actually come from somewhere else like Illyria and ultimately settled in Sardinia or, or Sicily, and that's kind of why they have linguist- linguistically similar names. So anyway, what made the Sea Peoples begin their migration? Well, that's kind of where I go back to those init- that initial survey that we talked about, where the earthquakes, drought, all of those natural, even a volcanic eruption causing some sort of climate shift in Northern Europe or the, the Near East. I tend to think that's actually what caused this rapid migration of peoples from, you know, the Dorians in northern Greece and Thrace, Illyria, which is more of like the Croatian coast, Italy, potentially further north. I think it was a combination of all those factors that they realized that in order for their livelihood to be preserved, they needed to shift and start moving further south. And that's actually probably fairly uh, a valid theory in that. We do see inscriptions and paintings and works of and art in Egypt where it shows Ramses III's victory. And in those victory paintings, we don't just see warriors from the Sea Peoples, but we actually also see oxen carts and evidence that they brought their wives and children with them. So they were actually looking for a place to settle, not just a place to subjugate, because it's important to note that they weren't acting on behalf of a, of a rival king or empire. They were acting as a tribe looking for survival in their own in their own interests. So it would make sense for them if they were no longer able to gather food or survive in their current land, or they had another enemy threat that we're just unaware of, putting pressure on them and forcing them to move further south. And that's why they would have brought their families with them across the eastern Mediterranean. The difficulty in ascertaining who exactly the Sea Peoples were. Uh, like that's the best that we can get as far as having linguists look at these names and then kind of assigning what we think and cross-referencing them. The Philistines is pretty compelling. Potentially some Greeks with the Denyan, Denen, like it's it's compelling. But I think it's also interesting, just like I mentioned in some of these these works of art from that time period, along from Ramses the Third, where they show ox carts and families. They also showed some of what they were wearing. And it's interesting, the hairstyles were generally long or in mohawks. Some were clean shaven or some had long beards. There were helmets with feathers and horns. And, you know, instantly when I heard like, you know, helmets with horns, I was like, oh, it's like the Vikings. But in reality, Vikings didn't have helmets on their horns that, or horns on their helmets. That was like a, an opera invention later. But yeah, I did yeah. think like, wow, that's kind of like barbarian, like Roman barbarian-esque, the way that they were dressed and not their dress and the way that they, the weapons that they were using. Uh, They were using swords, double-edged swords, which was an innovation at the time. Um, So, they were obviously very warlike. And I just very, I kind of thought, okay, this sounds to me not just like, hey, it's just a tribe from Northern Greece or Illyria. It's probably further north and they had begun their movement 
you know, probably decades or even centuries before where they had just slowly moved all the way down and then they got to the ocean and they're like, let's keep going. Um, you know, we don't have a ton of physical descriptions of them uh, either. So, like the Shekelesh could be, they could be Etruscan and the Peliset could be somewhere from a, a different part of Anatolia and became the Philistines. Like we, we don't fully know. It's just those, those guesses. But I do think it's an interesting thought that I, I do think some were from a little further north in like maybe Central Europe and had come down. Yeah. Um, but it kind of brings me back to the point of they were migrating away. They were the, the straw, the proverbial straw that broke the camel, camel's back of the systems mm-hmm. collapse theory, right? Like earthquakes, earthquakes, drought, all of that put a lot of pressure on it. Internal strife on these social orders. You throw in some barbarians coming down and it's just going to completely collapse it. And so, like, they were so effective. Like, and then Ramesses III saying it, like, they were burning. Nobody could stand before them. So, um, looking at Mycenae, Greece, um, there was no record of buildings being new buildings being constructed. Like we have no archaeological evidence from like 1200 to like 800 BC. We have huh. no archaeological evidence of like new new city states, new buildings. We don't have anything written down. So it's like a dark age within Greece. Yeah. Um, and that's how. And the, we do see like deep mass depopulation, right? So. And then you take that over into the Hittites, like Hattusa was destroyed. The Hittites were, were scattered. I think, a few, you know, in, within some of these cities, people tried to move back into uh, immediately afterward or shortly thereafter. But it was like they would, like Hattusa kind of went on for two years and then they just abandoned it, right? Because huh. if a city was designed for 50,000 people and you have 500 people or 1,000 move back in, it's, it's just not going to work the same way. You're going to have a right. lot of problems. So. Um, and they moved out and you can almost kind of see where they all moved through. They moved through Mycenae, Greece, <clears throat> Cyprus, and Anatolia. They absolutely devastated Canaan. Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting as I get into the, the Hebrew and kind of the early versus late uh, Exodus theory is like, they very clearly show that at the late Bronze Age, the new archaeological sites that were built prior versus beforehand, it, it's just this dramatic decline. And so they say, like, hey, this signals a significant population decline. And then suddenly, uh, you know, 100, 200 years later, it's like it just rapidly shoots back up. So that's proof mm-hmm. that, the, that's proof that the, uh, the Israelites had moved into the area. So um, why now the Sea Peoples were ultimately defeated by the Egyptians, um, Ramesses III specifically. So they had actually had a brief encounter kind of allying with the Libyans in 1207 BC, but were defeated by Pharaoh uh, Menepta. But that wasn't the last that he was going to see him. Later, um, in Ramesses III's reign, maybe 30 years later, he started having conflicts with the Sea Peoples as they had moved all, like I said, all the way down through Canaan into, into Egypt. So they attacked by land and sea. Fortunately for the Sea Peoples, Ramesses III was was very uh, competent in his capa- in his abilities on the battlefield, and was able to essentially lure their ships in, ambush them within the Nile Delta, and then dispatch of the the land army. Now, according to him, it was utter devastation. However, I think historians and archaeologists uh, archaeologists have gone back and seen that a lot of the area was devastated, and more than likely, he probably had some pretty significant casualties. Simply because after this point, Egypt never really extended further into Canaan or southern, the southern Levant. Uh, prior to this, like that was almost like a tributary, like they controlled and would battle with the Hittites over that area. But after this point, they never really contested again. So it kind of shows that he suffered a pretty big blow in his military. And then he actually conscripted, as I mentioned, a lot of these sea peoples back in and resettled them and many of them in Canaan. Um, so it, it kind of makes sense that, hey, maybe they were pretty pretty strong and they really tested him. So that's why he said, hey, I've got to fill the gap with some of my soldiers. I'm just going to use the ones I just defeated. So that was kind of the end of the sea peoples. Um, it's really as much as we know. We do know that they were really effective. Um, and this is what Robert Drew really, he, he says is kind of the, the main reason why it was a shift in the style of warfare, right? So it wasn't, 
it wasn't just the systems collapse, but it was a style of war that the Sea Peoples brought in. A lot of other, like the Assyrians began to use. So prior to this in the Bronze Age, they were heavily reliant on chariots. And chariots were like mm. almost everything in the battlefield. Like there was a battle um, like a hundred years prior to the the Bronze Age collapse called Kadesh between the Egyptians and the Hittites. And it was a major battle. But the only people that did the fighting were the charioteers. And then they had these foot runners that would run kind of alongside them. But it was relatively small compared to if you think about this masses of infantry that were conscripted and brought down, they didn't actually ever engage each other. It's just the chariots. Hmm. And so his point is that looking at how expensive chariots were. You had to have horses. You had, I think um, in the Old Testament does reference like Solomon paying like 150 shekels for the ho- silver shekels for the horses, 650 for the chariots. That's a lot of money to field an yeah. army. And yeah. especially as I mentioned that iron was becoming much easier, cheaper to produce. I can outfit um, soldiers, foot soldiers in heavy, heavier armor, not necessarily heavy armor, but heavier armor and mm. employ them in the battlefield um, in more guerrilla type ambush attacks. I can really destroy these chariots, and chariots essentially after the Bronze Age collapse disappear altogether. And again, in the Old hmm. Testament, you read a lot where like there's praises. I think it's Exodus 15 where they talk about the Egyptians' uh, chariots being completely destroyed, and so like the the chariot kind of goes away in favor of more heavy infantry. Um, and mobile infantry type of attacks, as well as ranged weapons um, like javelins, mm. air archers. You know, prior to that, chariots would often, you know, you would have one on there driving. Uh, the Hittites could put three, but you and the Egyptians would have two, but one of them would be shooting arrows. Well, but again, if you only have, if you limit that to uh, the effective soldiers that are using ar- arrows are just the ones on chariots. That's a huge, that's a very small portion of your military that's yeah. not using ranged weapons. Well, now again, with iron weapons, we can have iron tip bows mass produced and I can employ it much in a much greater effect and across a greater number of soldiers. So mm-hmm. like warfare really changed and we see, and you know, Robert Drew kind of uh, alludes to the fact that the Sea Peoples were fighting this way, as well as a few others like the Assyrians, and they were able to quickly dispatch um, all of these other civilizations because they just weren't ready to meet the menace um, huh. the way they fought. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I'm not going to belabor the earlier point about like disruptive technologies, but um, you know, from a military history standpoint, like it is fascinating to see how warfare adapts, and oftentimes. It's like you fight your enemy kind of over and over and over again, like the Egyptians and the Hittites, like they kind of, uh, you know, they, they fight each other over and over and over again. That leads to a decrease in modernization because they're like, they es- establish rules of the game, right? And it takes complete outsider to come in and just shrack both of them in order for them to be like, oh, shoot, we should like change our tactics. <laughs> That's exactly what body. happened at Kadesh. It was like, hey, we're only going to have chariots engage in battle. And, you know, both kings led, you know, they fought in Ramesses III, obviously self-proclaimed heroics, you know, that he he recorded. But like both kings led their chariots in battle. But again, it was just the chariots, like the mass, the infantry never met each other on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. So, you're right. Um I think that's kind of a good segue. You'll see why into some of the the more of the thought experiments experience mm. experiments of history here with with the Iliad and the Odyssey. So Robert Drew and I think a few others really put the date of like the fall of Troy of like 1180 to 1190 BC, so right in that area era, right? So if you think about that, that is happening right when the Bronze Age collapse is occurring. And I was just doing some research on this. It kind of struck me. And a lot of people think that there is some allegory within the Iliad and the Odyssey to the conflict between the Sea People and the Greeks and the Hittites, actually. So if you look at where we now consider the Hittite kingdom, it, it is Turkey. And then there's kind of a little space around where we think Troy was. And so there's kind of a discussion of like, well, were the Trojans Greeks or were they Hittites? Kind of a both. The answer is probably a little bit of both. Um, but um, the reason we we kind of think that, well, the Iliad is this allegory. If you 
Read Homer and the way he describes the employment of chariots, the armor, the way that they fought, it was not the way they would have fought in the Bronze Age. Not at all. And so there's kind of this evidence of like, well, he wouldn't understand it because he had no way to know. He lived potentially to at least 200, a, potentially 600 years later. And yeah, like was, I mentioned earlier- like several hundred years after the Several fact. hundred so years. saying we, like, was the way he was describing it how they fought after the Bronze Age? No, he was describing was he just as like best he understood. Up? Because mm. it was, think about like a 200 to 600 year game of telephone where you have this oral tradition of these conflicts that occurred and centuries later, he is now trying to retell it without all of the, the archaeological evidence that we have now. Yeah. He's trying to retell it as best as he can. Like talking about the greaves, uh, like we know that they were, you know, many grieved warriors. Well, he didn't really know what greaves were because they kind of went out of style in the Iron Age, right? So they, hmm. the whole bot, the way armor was employed and used and designed changed in the Iron Age. So by the time Homer was writing and it would have been completely different, his frame of reference would have been off. So all mm. he would have had was this oral tradition of this conflict between the Greeks and the Trojans and or the really maybe potentially the sea peoples and that were some of them were Greek and then the Hittites. So kind of a couple other things that shed some light on that are the fact that um, we do know for a fact that a lot of these cities um, just ceased to exist and then new ones came up, Sparta, Athens. I think Thebes was one that was sacked, but um, where um, Agamemnon rallies the Greeks or the Achaeans was in, um, like the was near Thebes actually. So, and he kind of does this roll call of all the ships, the ships right that are sailing across the sea with all these soldiers over to to Troy to burn it down, you know, to to avenge yeah. um, the the disgrace of his brother and and Paris stealing um, Helen. You know, it it just kind of rings of like, okay, well, so all of these Greeks rallied around each other, these different tribes went across the sea and sacked a giant city, and he's just describing it as what he knows to be Greeks. These, you know, the Acha the Achaeans. He is he is trying to make sense of that to the best of his ability because it was all an oral tradition being passed down. And then you get into the fact that I mentioned earthquakes and some of these buildings being damaged. Um, it's it's funny because we know that earthquakes were happening. We do know that cities were damaged and burned and looted and disappeared. If you look at Troy, so you, I think it's, we, we assume it's between Troy 6 and 7 that this occurred. Uh, and I say 6 and 7 because the way ancient cities would work is you would come in over the top of a previous civilization and just build a new mm. city. So, it was literally yeah. like we can we look at all these different – it's like – dating rocks. You can see the different layers. You can see the layers, um, yeah. Yeah. And so, even within six, there's like six and then six alpha because we're like, hey, there's like a some sub uh, building going on mm -hmm. in here. But between there, you can see that, okay, this city was completely destroyed. It was, it was a massive city, obviously very important, and it had a huge outer wall, exactly like it was described in the, in the Iliad, huge outer wall. So, it would have been a very formidable city. It was completely destroyed burned and looted. And then some people tried to come back in for a little bit afterward and then moved out quickly before the next Troy was built on, more the next city was built on top of it. And like I mentioned, um, you know, with Schaefer thinking that, hey, th there's a lot of evidence to point that it's an earthquake. Maybe the earthquake didn't cause the destruction of the city, but it destroyed it enough so that the Greeks could come in. Think about how difficult it would be to, um, at this point with no siege weapons to destroy a walled city. It'd be almost impossible, especially if they yeah. have their own agricultural centers inside the city. You know, we talk about the Trojan horse. I mentioned this last week is, well, the Trojan horse was a gift from Odysseus. Odysseus is also the god of earthquakes. We know earthquakes were happening. What if an earthquake had struck the city? Odysseus damp or Neptune? Or not they're the same. Neptune. They're the same. Neptune's the Roman version of it. You said Odysseus. Oh, oh, um, not yeah. Poseidon. Excuse me, Poseidon. That's Poseidon. It. I'm thinking Odysseus is the one who's considered responsible for the idea, right? Right. The gift of Poseidon. Excuse me, Poseidon or Neptune. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it was considered his idea, gift of um, Poseidon. Um, but Poseidon was the god also of water and earthquakes. So think mm -hmm. about. 
you know, 400 years later, we're talking about this conflict of your ancestors and you really don't fully know who they are attacking another group, kind of potentially a Hittite kingdom. And you know that there was a gift from Poseidon that knocked it down. It could have been, a, and it's very plausible that it changed to an earthquake had destroyed the wall or destroyed the gate and you were able to go yeah. in and charge with your new weapons. Because a, a great sword, a double-edged sword is great, but it's not going to do anything against a wall. That wall's right. open, very different story. So I think right. that's kind of where it's fun to look at the historical facts that I had talked about, kind of overlay it with some of what what we would say is is somewhat of a mythological type yeah. of story, a, a Greek myth, and say, hey, I think there's a connection here, and I think this really did happen, but probably a lot different than what what Odys or what Homer had said. As a matter of fact, right. we don't really know when Homer lived. And the Odyssey and the Iliad could have been written by two different authors. We, we aren't 100% sure. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just an interesting thought. Yeah, it's uh, one thing that I th- was thinking about is like Homer lived pre, pre the historical profession, right? Like Herodotus, as the first historian, came well after all this stuff. So, it's like, Even like the mere idea of history and there being like someone who does history, like that doesn't even exist at this point. So, you know, if we all remember back to our high school English classes, like Homer is not to be taken literally. So it is kind of interesting. um, Interesting to think about, oh, like what does all this stuff mean? And, you know, how can that inform us now retroactively going back and trying to do the history and see what's up? Indeed. As a matter of fact, now that takes me to something that could be taken very literally. Mm -hmm. And actually, in many cases is. So, if you've ever read, you know, if you've ever gone to church or you've been in synagogue, you know Uh the story of Exodus, right? So, like, right. The, the Hebrews, the Israelites leaving Egypt, wandering in the, de- in the wilderness, and then inheriting the land of Canaan. I don't know, as soon as we started talking to this, I was like, huh, I think that these two things happened kind of in a similar time frame. Yeah. And so, I started doing a little bit of research on it just to see like where this was all going on because the Near East in this entire area was wildly chaotic for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so, how would a group of people potentially numbering in the millions wandering around with no real weapons survive? And yeah. so, I, I did some research and apparently there's two theories on when the, the Israelites left Egypt. And so, there's like an early, uh, an early period um, exit, uh, exodus and a late stage one. In the early stage, it's, it's like 1600 BC. And there's actually a couple different dates that they've kind of thrown around. I tend not to not to fall into that camp, um, just because that means that all of these battles, like the Battle of Kadesh, that occurred between the Hittites and the Egyptians, the Sea Peoples, as they've said, devastating the land of Canaan and completely depopulating. Like the Israelites would have been in the middle of that, and we would have had more record of armies just strolling through, basically untouched fighting each other in the middle of this area. Like it, it just didn't make a lot of sense. But in the, the late stage Exodus, it occurred sometime around 1200 BC. And if you start lining up the dates where they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, that means they probably would have arrived in Canaan post um, Egypt fighting the Sea Peoples, uh, post collapse of the Hittites, collapse of the Mycenaeans, and the Sea Peoples having migrated onward, except for the Philistines, who would have been devastated by fighting the Egyptians. So, my theory is that um, the Israelites had left, had left Egypt around 1200 BC, and uh, if, you, if you believe in God and you believe in the veracity of the Bible, which I think a lot of listeners do, myself included, and you'd have to say that there's some sort of divine uh, guidance occurring during all of this to line those dates up accordingly. Because otherwise, the, if the Hebrews had left earlier, they would have been in the middle of one of the most tumultuous periods in history, almost undefended. Whereas here, they came and arrived to establish Israel right after um, the Bronze Age collapse and would be able to uh, more or less establish a kingdom, not necessarily undisturbed, but in a vacuum where they could grow and kind of defend themselves. Yeah. No, that's, it's interesting. Um, the, you know, if you look at 
the book of Exodus and how that uh, that slavery is described is it is it's very much seen as this like one not chattel slavery that many Americans are familiar with like it's not quite the same even so we only kind of see it only becoming a bad thing once they get tasked to like do the brick and mortar and then it's like hey you can't use it without you have to make these bricks without the straw and you get harsh taskmasters that's when it seemed like we need deliverance from this situation so even from like a theological perspective you know when you think about like oh no that was it 400 years 400 years the israelites were in egypt right it's like maybe that was that was god like trying to protect his people <laughs> from this crazy time and then when it was like ready for him to go you know he provided a way for them to go and then you know i liked your comment earlier about like you know the near middle east uh at this time was wildly chaotic it's like you if you just read the old testament like it's easy to miss that and like you said like they didn't have weapons really um i mean i'm sure they probably made some along the way but you know, the idea is like they completely displaced and founded a new kingdom amongst an extremely hostile environment. Uh, I think a lot of times we can kind of get the picture that it's like, oh, the Israelites, like they're really scary and bad people that they displaced. But uh, we kind of miss the fact it's like they were probably warring amongst each other this entire time. Uh, and it was like a very dangerous place to go into. And you kind of have these people that just like left Egypt, <laughs> kind of meandering their way like this massive caravan of folks. Uh, and anyway, it just kind of makes it all even more remarkable when you think about uh, what happened, um, uh, happened amongst all that. Yeah, it's just something interesting to think about that I came across, you know, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey and uh, Exodus. And I thought they... There's an interesting connection, and I think it's important for us to take a look at the Bronze Age collapse as a whole. And if you're going to compare it to today, it's, it's a little difficult because it's, there's a 3,000-year gap, right? But it's interesting that this has occurred a, kind of multiple times, if you think about it, a mass, you know, some unsettling events uh, in the climate uh, or just within trade, plagues, famines all of that sort of thing. And there's a displaced group of people moving in mass and it destabilizes a region. Um, That's pretty much what happened to Rome uh, with the barbarian invasions. They were displaced and um, ultimately Rome couldn't stem the tide long enough to withstand all the barbarians and they collapsed under the weight. Um, You know, will that happen today? We'll see. Um, I just think it's interesting for us to take note of and say like that is something that has recurred throughout history and it's it's worth watching and understanding. And then taking it, um, uh, you know, another look at this, it's really difficult to understand everything that was occurring as far as who the Sea Peoples were because the only writings we have, it's kind of like looking at the Huns. It's like, who were the Huns? But we only know about them and a lot of these barbarians by what other people wrote about them. We don't know much about the Sea Peoples. We know what the Egyptians thought about them, right? That's kind of how we have to take this view of history. It's like, well, we don't know a ton about this time other than what some obscure writings were, you know, uh, that we managed to find in, in a few of these kingdoms we're talking about indirectly, right? So it's like, well, we didn't know the, the Pelis, you know, we didn't know the Pelisets. Well, we know what the Egyptians wrote about them. That's about it. And so right. um, there is some conjecture that we have to take, but it's, it's all in good fun. Right. No, Colin, that was that was a really interesting episode. Uh, just like the last one, I don't know too terribly much about the Bronze Age, but I really enjoyed listening to you describe all that. And hopefully you, the listener, did as well. Um, we really enjoy hearing feedback from you guys. So uh, tell us what you think. You can comment uh, on the video. And if you really like what we're doing here, the best way to support us is to Leave us a five-star review, like the video if it's on YouTube, and, and give us a comment that tells the algorithm to share us with more of, more of people like you. Uh, and uh, also, feel free to tell us what you want us to cover next. Our next series is going to be on the fall of the French Third Republic.
which is kind of a late 1800s into World War II. So the French Third Republic fell in 1940 when, when the Nazis came in, invaded, and stood up Vichy France. So we're going to talk about that next. But um, if you've got ideas that you want us to hit, feel free to give us a comment. Tell us what you want us to cover. And with that, we look forward to meeting with you all next week here on the Lawrence of History.